now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We go back with more crime drama, such as it is, to March 2nd, 1954, Frank Sinatra as Rocky Fortune, his episode entitled The Doctor's Dilemma. Frank Sinatra, transcribed as Rocky Fortune. NBC presents Frank Sinatra, starring as that footloose and fancy-free young gentleman, Rocky Fortune. Hi, this is Rocky Fortune. You know, for a guy who went to school under the L tracks and learned his alphabet off of neighborhood store windows, I'm at the head of a mighty fancy class these days. I signed a new lease on life when I stopped Perry Shane, a Park Avenue legal eagle, from bending down in front of a hot slug poured his way by an ex-con. Perry, being the rich understanding type, showed his thanks by offering me a process-serving job in his 14-carat law factory. In the workings of my new job, I do not have the ticking of a time clock to affect my sunny disposition. However... On this particular day, my sunny disposition went south. In fact, everything was pouring. The skies and Mr. Shane, who was now pouring himself a slug of something that couldn't possibly be tea. Come in, Rocky. Sit down. What's with the early cocktail session? The rain got you down? No. Matter of fact, I like the rain. Mr. Shane? I will endanger the morale of your office by being the first employee to accept libation during office hours. Well, I'm sorry, Rocky. I just forgot. Please join me. Well, I don't usually, but since I suggested it, I will. Eh? Here you are. Thanks. You know something? I wonder how the poor people are making out. Here we are, warm in a mink-lined office, not a worry in the world. Smug as a bug in a rug. Did you say smug? That I did. I suddenly heard myself talking, I guess. <laughs> Strange you should say that. I was just thinking that about myself. Problems? Oh, well, not mine. A friend. I wonder how you'd handle this. Well, try me for size. I can't tell you what the problem is, Rocky. Legally, as an attorney, I should turn it over to the police. Yet it'd break his heart if it did. Well, uh, can I find out about it from the friend? It's an idea. You can. Tell you what, Rocky, uh, I'll write down a name and address. Here are the keys to my car. Take it and go right over. The name and address on the card sent me uptown to a swank number in the 90s. The plush elevator took me to a doctor's Park Avenue fantasy nestled high among the 32nd floor hills of solid concrete and mahogany. The name on the card opened the door himself. Dr. Jonas? Oh, come in, Mr. Fortune. Perry Shane called me about 15 minutes ago. Uh, let's go over here into my study. We'll be more comfortable. Fine, if I can wade through this rug. Uh, oh, yes. I just want to make sure of one thing before we go into the study. Excuse me. Stanley? Stanley? Yes, Dad? I just wanted to make sure you were in. Make sure you talk to me before you leave. Don't worry. I'm right here. And that's my son. Everyone else is gone. I wanted to make sure we weren't overheard. Yeah, it's a real lush layout. You live here too, Doc? I have the entire floor. I, I live and office here. Of course, being head of the Witherspoon Clinic, I also office over there. Oh, uh, please sit down. Thanks. What's on your mind, Doc? Perry has told you nothing of what's going on. From where I sit, he's clean. He knows nothing about it. I suppose it has to be that way. As an attorney, he'd be duty-bound to go to the police. 
Maybe I can help get you started. From the way you talk to your son, I figure maybe he's in trouble. We're both in trouble. I have to inventory next week, and I have no way of explaining the disappearance since I can't account for it in my records. Disappearance of what, Doctor? Why, drugs, Mr. Fortune. A large quantity of drugs have been stolen from my cabinets. So why not call the cops? Because the thief is my son, Mr. Fortune. Do you know how much is missing? Over the past year, I'd say at least oh, $25,000 worth. Wow. Isn't that a lot of dope for one doc to be stocking? That's for this office and the clinic. However, it is a ridiculous amount. Additional orders have gone through with my signature forged to them. I found one in my son's room. He's not only a thief, he's a forger as well. Um, uh, is he on the stuff? Of course. He's been on it for quite some time. Can't you quiet the whole thing by just sending him away for the cure? If it were only that simple. I have to keep narcotic records, of course. I have to account for everything I prescribe. How can I account for $25,000 worth of drugs in one year? The amount is ridiculous. And that means if you don't put them in the can, you lose your license and you go to jail yourself. Exactly. He can't possibly be taking that amount himself. Of course not. And he refuses to tell me what he's been doing with it. How about letting me talk to him? I... I wish you would. I... I, I can't talk to him anymore. I get almost hysterical. I keep wishing that I... I can't even say it. Why don't you try? Might ease you off a bit. Uh, my wife died four years ago. I keep wishing that he had died instead of her. Oh, take it easy, Doc. Let me talk to him. So I find out that the streets can be dirty even on Park Avenue. This is for real, the doctor's dilemma. Here's a guy who's got everything in the world to give his kid, and the kid fouls up with the dirtiest mud in the whole world. Don't. This boy I put on my list even before I made the talk with him. I shook fins with a wet fish, and he went right to the top of the list. Mr. Fortune is trying to help you out of your mess. Now try to be civil to him. I'll be in the other room. Who needs you? Why, you young... Take it easy, boys. Make some pictures for an outsider, and maybe something can happen. And call me if he gives you any trouble. But since when can you handle me? Slow down, Junior. If he can't, I can. Now look, creep. If you want to help somebody, join the Salvation Army. Here, here. You didn't dig that kind of jive out of Park Avenue. Where'd you get it? I... I have nothing to say to you. So we'll call the feds and you'll say it to them. He wouldn't dare call anyone. Son in jail? <laughs> I guess you'd feel better if your old man went to jail in your place. What are you talking about? Exactly what I said. He's got his records to worry about, son. His drug records can't possibly jive since he can't account for all the stuff you swiped. Think it over, Buster. Why? Well, I, I didn't think of that. You didn't think, period. Now, come on, give with some information. Well, what do you want to know? That's better. What did you do with most of the stuff you swiped? I mean, outside of what you used yourself. I sold the stuff at school. But why? Doesn't the old man give you enough loot? I guess so. For ordinary expenses. So what's the extraordinary expenses? Well, the usual thing. Dates. I, I played some horses. I... And then you also maybe needed something stronger than the stuff you swiped from your old man. Something like heroin. Oh, no, please... Please don't tell my father. He doesn't know yet that it's heroin. Why don't you stop it, kid? If you're on the kick, get off of it. I can't. I I tried. I tried you everything. You tried everything but going to your old man who could cure you. I couldn't go to my old man for anything. He don't know I'm alive. All right, take it easy now. Sit down. Dr. Jonas. Yes? Will you come here for a minute? Now, look, kid. When your father gets in here, I'm going to make the same question, and you give me the same answer. Maybe if we blow some of the smoke away, we can get the team together. You having trouble with my son? No, no trouble at all, Doc. Please sit down. It's an effort to sit in the same room with him. Well, maybe if you sat in the same room a little more often, this wouldn't have happened. You two are still on the same team, so act like it, will you? Now, look, just a couple of minutes ago, Doc, I asked your son why he didn't go to you to ask him to kick the heroin. Heroin? My own son on that filthy habit, and I didn't know it? That's what I'm getting at. You, a doctor with a son on a rottenest kick of all, and you haven't seen enough of him to see it. Where did you get it, Stan? I don't have heroin in my office. He hasn't told me yet, Doc. But I'll make he buys the stuff with the loot he makes by selling the milder stuff he swipes from you. But why? You have money from your mother's estate? Doctor, look. Yes, look. Look at my son, a thief, a forger. Why do you think he did all of this, Doc? Who knows why he did it? 
What would make my own son put me in a position where I would either have to send him to jail or be sent there myself? I'm... I'm sorry, Dad. I... Well, I never realized about the drug record. She said that... I mean, I didn't know... I looked at the old man to see if he caught the slip. No action. I looked at the kid. He was beginning to look better. Instead of the wet fish I thought I saw at first, my impression took to the right flank march. This was another poor little rich kid. He could have all the laughs he wanted. But I guess a laugh is kind of empty when nobody home laughs with you. The father was a Frankenstein to his son, and the old man didn't know why. And it was time for the son to get a friend to turn to. I put myself in front of him on what I hoped was the right turn. He played right down the line. I'm... I'm sorry I caused the old man all this trouble. It's now his middle name, kid, and it's pretty much in your lap to get him out. And yourself, too. Well, what can I do? Just go to the police? No, nah, he won't be off the hook if you're in the can, kid. He's not a bad guy, you know. Yes, I guess I know. Now, look, before we do anything, let's clear up one little miss. What do you mean? The name of the dame you were thinking about when your tongue did a tailspin a little while ago. Well, I wasn't thinking about anybody in particular. Stan, to bring those words in front of your ears, I make the quotation. You started to say, she said that. And you tried to rub out the statement. Who's the she? Rocky, I, I can't involve her. Since Mother died, she's the only friend I've had. Does she know your father? Well, of course, but she wouldn't do anything to hurt him. If she knew about the drug records and let it go on, believe me, she'd hurt him. Is she more important to you and your old man? I don't know. Why can't I go to the police and confess the whole thing? Why do I have to hurt everybody I love? March 2nd, 1950. Rocky Fortune on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Frank Sinatra as Rocky Fortune, March 2nd, 1954. The lights went on all over the world. Nineteen years old and in love with the only gal he could turn to. A gal who knew something about the narcotics record. This the doc must know about. He did. There's only one girl he can possibly mean, but it never entered my mind that she could be involved. Why, she's been with me ever since she finished her training. What kind of training? She a nurse? Of course, my nurse, Miss Carroll. Young, curvy, nice soft shoulder for the kid to weep on? I suppose so. Frankly, I never took too much notice. You know, for a doc, you don't seem to take much notice of anything. Does she keep your drug records? She keeps them, but she locks them up in my desk drawer. Where can we find this Miss Carroll, Doctor? I sent her home, so I suppose we can find her there. Do you really think she's gotten him involved in this? Well, he's a very young and tender 19. And he thinks he's in love, and you can make book that this Carol is the object of his affections. If that's the case, let's get the police after her. The feds are awful careful about how doctors use the narcotic supplies. If an order is out of line, they investigate. So with the amount of stuff Junior had faked as coming to Park Avenue address, it couldn't have been possible to get away with it. Some of it had to be sent to another spot they could get at. That spot could be the clinic. The finger was right in Carol's eye. As the doc put the finger in Miss Carol's doorbell. Who is it? Dr. Jonas, Miss Carol. Oh, just a minute, doctor. I'll slip into a robe. Tell her it's come as you are, party. We'll save time. Time is something we have very little of. Both narcotic inventories must be made next week and sent in. Check. If she's up to her neck, she's got to move out before then, right? Right. So, we see which way she moves when we give her a real strong arm to use. Incidentally, let's keep the confab low out here. Play this cool and follow the leader. Just don't be thrown by anything I might come up with. Sometimes I don't quite understand your language, Rocky, but I do understand the things you've pointed out. I know now how I've failed as a father. Well, if my plan works, at least you'll have made up for part of it. The kid's on the kick. We know he's his Ford's orders, but we don't know everything. Since he feels he's in love with his baby, could be playing hero. Yes, but no matter what happens, I know he has to pay for what he's done. Shh, careful. Sorry to keep you waiting, Doctor. I didn't know anyone was with you. Uh, come in, please. Uh, thank you, Miss Carroll. This is Mr. Fortune. How do you do, Mr. Fortune? It's nice to see you, Miss Carroll. And I do mean nice. Thank you very much. 
Um, won't you have a chair? Sorry to intrude at your home, Miss Carroll, but this man has come to me with some very alarming news. Really? Uh, concerning me? <laughs> news about you would be a three alarm. How quaint. I told the doc here news about his junior. News that's worth dough to me. He said he wouldn't pay it till he talked it over with you. I said, fine, as long as I sit in on the chat. Start chatting, Doc. Uh, Mr. Fortune tells me my son is on heroin. Did you know that, Miss Carroll? So you finally know. Yes, I've known about it for a month now. I knew it would break your heart, and I've been doing everything possible to get him off it. I even promised to arrange a quiet cure for him. It's a little late for that, sweetie. How quiet the deal is depends on how the doc acts. What do you mean? I mean the kid's been peddling, too. That's impossible. I said he's been peddling. I know, because he peddled to me. Of course, I ain't interested in the chicken stuff he steals from his old man and sells. I only got time for the strongest stuff he uses himself. Do you mean he's been stealing narcotics from the office? I refuse to believe it. Doc, did I show you pictures of the kid handing the stuff over to me? It's true, Miss Carroll. I've seen the pictures. But Stanley's on heroin. We have no heroin, either at the office or at the clinic. Do you know where he gets it? I don't care about that. I'm only interested in my son. I'll see to it that he gets off the filthy stuff, but I can't have him treated as a common addict. I'll pay any amount of money to keep it quiet until he's cured. And why is it you to say that, doctor, in front of a blackmailer? Now look, sister, get one thing straight. I don't like the dirty money, so don't give me the blackmail bit. I'm on the stuff and I admit it. I've been on it a long time and it costs real dough. And I need the dough to keep me on it. Have you got any ideas on how I can get this stuff? I'll let the doc off the hook. Doctor, um, you said you would pay any amount of money to keep this quiet. Of course I will. Do you think I want to see my son like this man? Willing to lie, cheat, steal, do anything because he has to have the stuff? I'll pay every cent I have. Well, why don't you let me talk to this man, doctor? Perhaps I can help. Uh, tell you what, doc. I'll hold the picture as long as I get the stuff. If the little lady here helps me, fine. In the meantime, don't call me. I'll call you. I felt like giving the doc an Oscar for falling in with the line I was pushing out. Now it was up to me to keep the little lady entertained till he got back to Junior and gave him the lowdown. I was pretty sure of one bit. Papa had much more chance of getting Junior to listen to him now. But the kid had to be tipped before she got to him and she was bound to call as soon as she was alone. So I had to keep steady company with this chick till Junior learned the facts of life. The doc took the hint and left us alone. Charm school went to work. You said all you wanted out of your negotiation is to be able to get the stuff you need? Long as I get what I need, I make like a mummy, but I hold on to the picture. What will you take to let loose of the picture? I already told the old man. Ten grand in cash. You'll give up the negative if I get ten thousand for you? Well, the doc brought me here, but no reason why I can't do business with you. I'll go to the bank first thing in the morning. You have the negative here by 10.30 a.m. I'll tell the doctor I won't be in tomorrow until 11.15. <laughs> Cutting yourself in a little bit, huh? I'm looking after the doctor's interest. If you go near him again, I'll see to it that you don't get a cent. Don't worry about me, sister. As long as I get that dough, I'll be able to get all the stuff I need. That's all I want. Oh, stop whining and beat okay, it. Okay, okay, don't get mad. Please don't get mad. I'll have that negative here at 10.30. Honest, I will. Now, if the kid isn't too far involved, we're in business. So far, it looked like the little lady was taking all the bait we tossed out. The lady also had to work fast because she must know her little game is over when the inventory is taken. In the meantime, I had to deliver a negative in the morning. Stan and I looked at the birdie in a home-sized camera, took the next to a friendly photographer, and in the morning I would be set with this item. Next, I had to have a heart-to-heart -heart with the kid. By this time, he was willing to spill. I never even saw the extra stuff that came to the office and the clinic. But I thought you said you sold it to the kids you know. He only said that because he thought he was protecting her. Right, son? Well, that's right, Dad. I just wanted to confess to the whole thing to keep her name out of it. I, I guess I've been a fool about everything. Her, too. Well, if you've reached the age of 19 and have only been a fool over one woman, I'm proud of you. Those words are nice music to my ears, Doc, but we got a long road to haul before we're out of the wood. This little cookie's been plenty smart. She had Stanley forge your name to those orders, and that's still a big federal offense. That means I'll still go to jail. Somebody's got to take the rap when that true inventory's taken next week. You could still be that somebody. Both father and son looked pretty ragged when I told them that, but at least they were now standing together. 
what happened depended on what the chick did after I gave her the phony picture negative. I didn't know any of the narcotics gang, so I figured I'd better not have them in on a party that just might not come off. Better I should have my pal, Sergeant Finger, and let him bring them in. A call to him set his part of the plan. Even on Park Avenue, you can't stay out of the soup. But that was what the story was all about. March 2nd, 1954, Frank Sinatra, just before he won the Academy Award, as Rocky Fortune. You're listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these words from your favorite radio station. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better. Mike Lindell and MyPillow launching the MyPillow 2.0. Now, when Mike invented MyPillow, it had everything you could want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he's discovered a new technology that makes MyPillow even better. Of course, the patented adjustable fill of the original MyPillow, but now with brand new fabric with a temperature-regulating thread, it's the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow you'll ever own. Say goodbye to tossing and turning and flipping your pillow over in the middle of the night. And more great news on the MyPillow 2.0. Buy one, get one free offer with my promo code Wyatt. MyPillow 2.0 is 100% made in the USA, 10-year warranty, 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio podcast square to receive the MyPillow 2.0, buy one, get one free offer, use my promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now the conclusion of Rocky Fortune starring Frank Sinatra, The Doctor's Dilemma, March 2nd, 1954. Finger, look. The kid only went wrong because of the old man. How many kids do you know where this happens? Play along with me and give the kid a break. Smart guy. You know I got six kids. What else can I do? Wonderful. Look, we're all set now. You bug the doc's office and set up in the apartment below. I already got permission from the people who live there. You're awful sure of me. I hope you're as sure of what's going to happen. I'm not sure. It's a chance. It's his only chance. What's the idea of the army, Finger? I thought you weren't going to bring narcotics till we knew whether we were right or wrong. Whether you were right or wrong, Rocky, you don't monkey with the feds. Somebody goes to the pokey. We're set up now so we can hear everything that's said in the doctor's office. I know. And if Carol says what I hope she says, the kid's in the clear. If not... If not, they take in the kid with the girl. Well, I was just hoping I'd get a chance for another brainstorm, if I'm wrong. I give her the picture in the neg, and she knows the time is up when that inventory goes in. Now, if she only makes the move. So we listen. This is all a little difficult for me to understand. Nothing difficult about it, Doctor. You said you'd pay any amount of money to keep your son out of jail. I'm offering you the out. I've changed my mind about that, Miss Carol. My son has been selling narcotics to other juveniles. I'm, I'm afraid he must be prosecuted. Look, doctor, your son is guilty of one thing. He forged your name to those orders. Of course, he's also an addict. You mean my son did not steal any of the narcotics? He did not sell them? I control the whole setup. I supplied him with the stuff he used himself. I did the whole thing. And I know the time's short now. If he sold some stuff to this fortune, it couldn't have been much. But I now have the proof. And I'm holding the proof until you give me the money I need to get out of the country. Then you mean you're willing to take the blame for everything if I turn over 100,000 cash? That's right. I'll have that money plus what I've been making throughout the year on the sale of the other stuff. I'm willing to admit my game, sir. Move in and take all this down, boys. And then you can move upstairs and take her. It worked out exactly as you thought, Rocky, but I'm still in the dark as to how you figured her actions. Well, the time for the kid was short. Just one week and the whole thing would be discovered. But the time was just as short for her. She had to get out. So when we dreamed up that picture of the kid selling the stuff to me and you said you'd pay anything to keep him in the clear, well, she figured she'd buy it from me at 10000 and sell it to you for a hundred grand. Then she gives you the bit that the whole thing can be blamed on her when the shortage is discovered. And being lost in some part of the world with enough money to last a lifetime, I... She knew she'd be safe. Exactly. 
And she only had him sign the fake signature to keep a stronger hold on him. Right again. Now, if we can only straighten out Stan, what do you think will happen with him? Well, first thing, since he's got a father again, Shane thinks he'll get a suspended sentence. He'll get the cure, and that's that. You know, if you'd only have realized one thing, this probably wouldn't have happened to the kid at all. And what's that? Well, when your wife died, you lost a wife, your son lost a mother. You're right. That's when I went to pieces and failed him. <laughs> Funny that coming from you. Your language doesn't sound like a college man. Your logic does. That's easy, too, Doc. You see, the school where I learned my logic, they don't teach language. NBC has presented Frank Sinatra as that footloose and fancy-free young gentleman, Rocky Fortune. Others in tonight's cast included Maurice Hart, Raymond Burr, Jack Carroll, Georgia Ellis, and Barney Phillips. Tonight's script was written by Norm Sickle. Andrew C. Love directed. Now to tell you about next week's adventure, here's Frank Sinatra as Rocky Fortune. According to the statistics, the average joker can expect to annoy the census taker until he's about 66. Next week, I'll tell you about a friend of mine who advised me to take out life insurance because you couldn't trust these figures. And to prove his point, he produced a fresh corpse. I'll tell you about it next week. March 2nd, 1954, Rocky Fortune on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Yeah, okay, if you think the guy sounds like Frank Sinatra, it's because he was. Thanks so much for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. I joked about the uh, the Frank Sinatra sound alike, but no, that really was Frank Sinatra. Uh, a number of people made a pretty good living back then, and even some do now, uh, imitating celebrities and uh, even in taking on the mannerisms. Uh, probably the best bet, uh, best of those that I can think of just right off the top of my head is uh, Frontier Town. Wade Crosby doing his uh, imitation or uh, affectation of W.C. Fields. Of course, Fields had already passed some time back, but it's still a well-known affectation even to this day, quite frankly. Okay, let me shut up now and uh, get to uh, Lum and Abner. We head back to Pine Ridge, Arkansas, and uh, the mess with their radio station as they prepare to present their first full-length feature radio program, Love Comes to Gilbert the Boy Trapper. This episode originally broadcast March 2nd, 1953. Now, Granny Zabner, I believe that's our ring. I know his Lum, I believe you're right. I'll see. Hello, John M. Downstore. This is Lum and Abner. And now, let's see what's going on down in Pine Ridge. Hello, this is Dick Huddleston again. Well, radio station VPR is really humming today. That's because those super salesmen, Lom, Abner, Grandpap, and Cedric, each sold an hour's time to four different Pine Ridge businessmen. And the trouble is, they each sold the same hour. And that puts Lom, the station's president, on the spot. But he has an idea, he claimed. And he'd better have, because it's time now for the four shows to go on the air. Oh, my goodness, look what time it is. Might now, 7 o'clock. Time we're supposed to go on the air. Ulysses, you better get over there to the generator and get ready to start cranking. Uh, okay. Uh, you know how to work it now, don't you? Yeah, I know, okay. I showed him how long. All right, now the rest of you get around the microphone here. Come on, Cedric, Grandpap. Let's see, now, where'd I put them dead blame scripts? Them what, Abner? Scripts. The word is script, Abner. That's this junk we're going to read here. Oh, uh, Lom, are you sure this idea of yours is going to work? Well, it's the only thing I could figure out. And even if it ain't the right idea, it's too late to do anything about it now. Yeah, but ain't them four sponsors going to be mad when they find out they all got the same time? Well, what else could I do? You fellas all sold them the same time. Well, you did too. So Moe's Moots is 7 to 8 o'clock time. Well, we ain't got time to argue about it now. It's 7 o'clock. Get set, everybody. 
Hey, Cedric, heist yourself a little over to the left. I can't see the microphone back here. Have you got the chimes all set, Abner? Yeah, that's what I got these skillets hung up here for. I'm going to bang on them. I wondered what them things are for. Yeah, that's the chime. All right, quiet, everybody. All right, let her go, Ulysses. All right, Abner. The voice of Pine Ridge is on the air. This is station VPR broadcasting frequently from our main studios located on the main floor of the elegant Jotham Down store overlooking scenic Main Street in the heart of downtown Pine Ridge. And this is Lum Eddards, the announcer that grins while he talks, bringing you the first in a series of a one-hour program entitled The Mose Moods Barbershop, Ira Hodgkin's Lever Stable, and Ed Beckley Drug Store, Caleb Wee Hunt Blacksmith Shop Hour. Featuring the Moe's Moots Barbershop, Ira Hodgkins Liver Stable, Ed Beckley Drugstore, Caleb Weehunt Blacksmith Shop Play Actors in Love Comes to Gilbert, the Boy Trapper. Starring Cedric Weehunt as Gilbert. No, there is no relation between the actors in this play and human beings dead or alive. The whole thing is strictly a coincidence. The opening scene opens in the Froze North where Gilbert is walking along with a weasel which he has trapped. He sees a deserted cabin and wonders who is in it. Stealthy, he enters the door, and to his horror, he sees a beautiful girl with yellow curls tied to a chair. He throws down the weasel and rushes in. Bravely, he exclaims, Well, read right here, Sam. Oh, oh, you poor maiden, are you in distress? Who has did this to you? Long do I have to take this part of a woman? Of course you do, Abner. You're the girl hero. You're Zsa Zsa Peabody. Don't I do not know. I was whopped on the head at the time. I will quickly untie you. Oh, but it is too dark. I cannot see to do it. Do you have a flashlight? Yes, Gilbert, I have a dandy. I bought it at Ed Beckley's drugstore located one block south of the Jotham Down store. It is a two-battery adjustable beam flashlight in black or red plastic case, complete with bulb at the unbelievable low price of 98 cents. Well, I do know. Also, genuine pig bristle toothbrushes, automatic orange squeezers, and a sorted flavored bath salts in a big five-pound economy bag. On sale this week, don't miss it. I won't. Oh, untie me quickly, and let us make our getaway from here, for here comes the varmint that tied me up, mean black Dan. Aha! Uh-huh. So you're trying to escape from me. A lucky thing I got here when I did. I never would have made it in this icy weather if I hadn't have had my horse shot at Caleb Weehunt's first-class blacksmith. Hold it, Grandpa. Hold it. There's a dead blame phone. We're going to have to do something about that, Abner. Yeah. Tell the radio audience to wait a minute. Yeah. Stand by, folks. A program will go on in just a second. Hello, John. I'm down, store. Can't have a phone in the Northwood. Oh, what is it, Caleb? I can't. Yeah, I know you bought this time, but you see, Ed Beckley... Well, if you'd have just listened a little longer, your ad's coming up right now. Yeah, but Caleb, you see, Ed Beckley paid us as much as... Well, Granny, she don't want to do that, Caleb. Your own boy is the hero of this show. He's Gilbert. It don't, huh? Well, all right, then, if that's the way you feel about it. All right, goodbye. What happened, Long? Ladies and gentlemen, you are now listening to the Mose Moots Ed Beckley Ira Hodgkins Hour. And tomorrow night, don't be surprised if you hear a new Gilbert. All right, go on, Grandpa. Did you have the last line there? Yeah, let's see here now. Oh, yeah. I never would have made it in this icy weather if I hadn't had my horse shot at... You can leave that out now. Jump down to the next line. How's that, Mom? Caleb ain't a sponsor no more. I don't blame him much. Let's see. I never would have made it in this icy weather... That's out now, Grandpa. Oh, yeah. Abner, you read your next line. Oh, Gilbert, save me from this demon-eyed villain. Have no fears, maiden. I will save you from his clutches, clutches, and we will flee in the buggy I have rented from Ira Hodgkin's liver stable on the west side of the street 
facing the jot em down store. I got one of these uh, luxurious four-passenger jobs now available at the new low picnic rate. Get yours today from Madman Hodgkins. I will. I'll go to the Hodgkins convenient location and hire one of them speedy talkies now available and overtake you. No matter where you go, I'll find you. Remember, Hodgkins buggies cover the world. Oh, is there no escape from this demon-eyed villain? Fear not, fear not, er, uh, fear not, fear not, er. Hold it, hold it. There's the phone again, Mm, Lom. Damn it. After this, we'll have to disconnect this thing. Just a minute, folks. Hello, John I'm down store. Oh, well, how's it coming in, Ed? Well, yeah, I was going to tell you about our Hodgkins being on the same... On... Well, I know you paid for the time, but you you heard your ad, didn't you? And you got another one coming up. Well, I know, Ed, but... Well, yeah, but... Well, all right. Sure. Goodbye. What did Ed say? Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Mose Moods Ari Hodgkins Hour. <laughs> we bring you the second act of Love Comes to Gilbert, the Boy Trapper. The first in a series of a one-hour program. On with the show. Well, go on. So good, I'm lost. I don't know where we are. Oh, well, just pick it up anywhere there. Oh. I never would have made it in this icy weather if I hadn't have had my horse shot at Caleb Weehunt. I know we're past that, Van Yeah, Beth. skip down to that part where Gilbert and a girl are escaping. Yeah, gallop of horses hoof. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. All right, now. Oh, uh, get up. Oh, Gilbert, you are so brave and fearless to rescue me from that demon-eyed villain. That surely was a close shave. Oh, thank you. I always get a close shave at Mr. Mose Moots' high-class barber shop. He is an experienced man with the razor and don't hardly never ever cut you hardly at all much. He is a good man on haircuts, too, specializing in both square and round types, like mine. Give your wife a rest and let Mose cut your hair. Yes, and I can always tell when you have been to Moe's Moses. By the way, you smell. No, Abner, you're reading that wrong. Uh, supposed to be, I can always tell when you've been to Moe's Moses by the way you smell. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that was a telephone again, Lon. Uh, oh, right. hold everything. I can always tell Hello. when you've been to Moe's Moses. Oh, what is it, Irie? By the way, oh. Well, now, Irie, I can explain all of that. Yeah, but you see, Moe's Moots paid for a full... Well, Irie, let me explain. Well, all right, if that's the way you feel about it. Goodbye. Did Ira? Yes, he did. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Moe's Moots Hour, the first in a series of a one-hour program brought to you by station VPR. All right, now let's see, where was we at? Gilbert just got a haircut. Oh, yeah. Well, now let's do that part over again. Yeah, cut his hair again. Yeah, it looks like Moe's is the only one who's satisfied with the program. Go ahead, Gilbert. Yes, Moe. I always get a close shave at Mr. Moe's Moose's barber shop. He is an experienced man with a razor and don't hardly There's never ever... There's a phone again, I believe, Lom. Yeah, Dad, blame. Hold it, Ted. Everybody oh, in town calls. Hello. Oh, howdy, Moe's. Well, how are you enjoying it? Oh, I bet he loves it. Well, now, wait a minute, Moe's. He does not. Oh. Well, I don't see what's wrong with that. You don't hardly ever cut nobody. But, oh, well, Abner just read that line wrong. Yeah. Yeah, but Moe's... Yeah. No. All right. Him, too? Yeah. Huh? Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances over which things has got out of control, you have just heard the last of a series of a one-hour program. <laughs> Now, usually, Lum and Abner didn't repeat their shows, or at least blatantly repeat their shows. But they had run the same series of shows about VPR back in 1947. And considering that it had been a good distance of time, and a lot of people were listening in 1953 that weren't listening then, that's why they did it that way, I guess. 
I, I'm not going to try to explain it. Uh, but that's the way it ran. And, and they had more of the beep of trying to run their own radio station. March 2nd, 1953, Laman Abner. I guess you're not going to hear. Isn't that fun? Yeah, it's, it, it, well, see, these days, you can just phone the orders back to the station and, and you know, or use your phone and text them in and, you know. The, the, back then, it was, you know, y'all just do what you can. They all sold at the same time. March 2nd, 1953, Lum and Abner here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. By the way, if you've been listening uh, to us for some time, you've heard a lot of these shows that we've done with Lum and Abner, and they're not very good as far as audio quality goes. Well, Ted over at RadioMemories.com, has taken his entire collection of Lum and Abner and ran them through uh, all sorts of uh, cleaning up. Uh, all the, what's the technical term? Restoration. That's what the technical term is. He's restored them to probably better quality than it would have been if you were listening at the time on your radio. Uh, you are, the Ted at RadioMemories.com supply shows on cassette, CD, or on flash drive for your computer. Talk to Ted. Contact him at RadioMemories.com. He has all sorts of great radio shows that he has restored and uh, making them available at very reasonable prices. Thanks for tuning in. Would you thank this station and support their advertisers? It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time you roll around here on your favorite station. If you miss a day, you do not have to miss a single show. All of our shows are available on demand at my webpage, classicradio.stream. Stream our shows. Learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can contact me. Find our social media links there. And if you'd like to support the show, You can buy me a copy. The buy me a copy money goes to help us acquire additional classic radio collections and maintain our distribution channels. That is at classicradio.stream, classicradio.stream. Have yourself a great day, won't you please? And tell all your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.